Hello Booktube and welcome to Tag Tuesday. This is uh, the day of the week that most people set aside for tags. I could do a tag every day this week with all the tags that I want to do. Maybe I'll do a couple more this week, but for Tag Tuesday I found a tag that I can't believe I've never done. I've searched my videos, but I'm not, I'm not all that good at searching my videos, so I may have missed it. I just can't believe that I haven't done a video like this since it's called the Nosy Booktuber tag and I am the original Nosy Booktuber. I am the nosiest Booktuber of all Nosy Booktubers. I want to know everything about all of you. Uh, and that's what this is. It was created by John at Written in Blood. I'll leave a link to his channel. And I saw it on Storm Reads. And it's eight questions of a nosy variety <laughs> about booktubing and about reading. Uh, and a, a, I have added to those questions. I have amplified this tag. Uh, but we'll start with the original eight. And number one is how many books have you read this year? Uh, and this is a an ongoing thing with me <laughs> as I just did the mid-year book freakout tag. Uh, as of this morning, I have read 625 books in 2020. And we're past the midway point of the year. So that is okay. That number is okay. I would like to see it higher. I admit that... Uh, like a lot of you, I, I hit a few patches of doldrums when quarantine was was at its worst, when the shock, the mental shock of that was was really dawning. Uh, and I also hit a, a snag in that I stopped getting tons of books in the mail. I, I, st I kept getting lots and lots of ebooks, but it was a while for me to shift over to ebooks, to reading on all the devices that I have. But still, uh, I'm, st I'm, I'm happy with that number and I can get that number up. I can get that number up a lot. Uh, and question number two is, of the books you've read, which is your favorite and which is your least favorite? And again, like I mentioned in the mid-year book freakout tag, I could do 30 videos on this subject. I do a definitive year-end roundup of books from that year on my literary blog, Steve Reads, which lives on Open Letters Review. I do that every year. I, I give a exhaustive best and worst books accounting of all of the new releases in the American market in 15 of the genres that I follow. And I intend to do that this year as well, of course. Uh, so I keep extensive notes on things like this so that nothing falls through the cracks at the end of the year, as things will do. It's amazing how things will do. Uh, so I, I'm, I could do 30 or 40 videos on this, but I'm going to just name one book each for now. These are very provisional. I don't think either one of them will be moved from the final list of best and worst, uh, but I don't know where their number will be. And the, the best fiction, the best thing that I've read so far this year, I think, is probably The Brutality of Fact by Larry Kramer, uh, the late Larry Kramer. Uh, gigantic fictional treatment of his experience in the AIDS epidemic that is so much more than that, but it is that, it is that as well. I just thought it was ferocious just incredible. I, I'm amazed that he had the... I'm actually not amazed. I'm actually... It's actually not surprising at all that he had the grit, the sheer determination to see this project through. 2,000 page novels. To see this project through before he died. Uh, and the worst thing so far, again, this will be on a spectrum. There will be... Pl it'll have plenty of company. Uh, Charlie Kirk, who's a picture of a peeled potato, and then put a tiny little face right in the middle of it so you, it's still mostly potato but you've got a tiny little face in the middle with a tiny little toupee on top uh, he's a I, I, he bills himself as a conservative thinker and talker he is not at all he is not at all the only way that's going to work is if you are like most of his followers extremely young Young enough so that you don't have any idea what you're talking about when you talk about American conservatism. Charlie Kirk is not an American conservative. He's just a fascist. He's just a Nazi. That's all. There's a wide gap of difference between those two. He doesn't like America at all. He is, he is, he'd be happy to see it replaced with a totally authoritarian dictatorship as long as he has a position in the Ministry of Propaganda. And he wrote a book called The MAGA Doctrine. And it's as every bit as loathsome as you would think. There is no such thing as the, as the MAGA doctrine. The, the, there is no such thing as the MAGA doctrine. And he goes on and on about it in the book. And the book is full of factual mistakes, full of blatant lying to his readers about matters big and small, from 
what Donald Trump has in mind when Donald Trump is on record. He can't keep his mouth shut about anything. And none of the things that he had on his mind when he did any of the things that Charlie Kirk calls the tenets of the MAGA doctrine were actually on his mind. He was able to hold up that facade for a day and then tweeted the real reason because it, I hate my enemies or because it will make me money or something or, or something like that. All the way to small details, like for instance, his offhand reference to Tim Pool, the booktuber Tim Pool, as a leftist commentator. Tim Pool is an, an alt-right fascist goon. He's, if you go to his YouTube channel, you don't even need to listen to one of his videos. I'd advise that you don't. If you go to his YouTube channel and just look at the titles of his videos, you will see a Charlie Kirk talking point laundry list with no leftist, quote unquote, leftist material mixed in at all. Just because Tim Poole calls himself a centrist, I think is what he calls himself, doesn't mean he is one. <laughs> no, it's, the, the MAGA doctrine is just, I mean, it's a combination of bootlicking and job application. It was just revolting, absolutely revolting. So it would count as the worst book I've read this year, but it will have lots of company by the end of the year. Uh, then question number three is, do you have a favorite time and place that you like to read? This is the kind of question I just love. I read a lot. Uh, keep in mind, I do nothing else except take care of my little dog. I do nothing else other than that. I don't have a job. I don't have school. I don't have family or loved ones. I don't have personal hygiene. I'm not even wearing pants. I don't do anything else. So that, that accounts for the number at the top of this video. But uh, and that also means that I have lots of times that I love to read. There are all, all kinds of different times that I love to do. I also sleep a lot less than you do, uh, which opens up even more time for me to read. Although I would have to say that uh, the favorite time and place changes with the seasons. I have a, a little couch out in one of the other rooms that is is it's in a corner. It's directly in a corner, bookended by windows. And in the spring and summer, that is a beautiful place to read in the early morning. Just beautiful. You take, take the bean out for a walk, come back inside, give her water and food, make sure that we're all burped and satisfied and steady, and then open the windows and just sort of lay on that couch. Often what I will do in that window that little area and that time early, early in the morning before anybody, before the world has started up, when it's nice and cool out there uh, and the, the air still smells of night, often what I will do then is just very peaceful reading. So no pencil in hand, usually no reviewing brief, just something that I want to read. And then as the day starts to gain steam, then I will start doing more pointed reading. And that's enjoyable too in its way, but I think that might be my favorite in the summer. Uh, in the warmer months, and then the, 10 months out of the year here in Boston, it's freezing cold, black skies, cracking concrete because of the, the low temperatures. And then it's just curled up in bed, buried under blankets. Uh, with my, I have not abandoned my blankets at all, even though I've got a fan going here, and I've got the air conditioning unit in one of the windows. I still haven't abandoned the blankets because it, it, it snowed in May in Boston and stayed freezing cold until June. So I don't believe that the warm weather is here to stay. It's not. I mean, we're almost in July. It's no more than six weeks until it starts to get cold again here. Uh, but anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nominate first thing in the morning on that couch. Uh, then question number four is how many hours per day do you have the opportunity to read? This connects with what I was talking about. I do nothing else. And I do it for a lot longer. I'm not, I'm not, uh, a lot of you, especially young people, of course, because young people are so tired, they're putting it in their Twitter handles. Uh, the, it, young people especially, at six in the evening, they are starting to look longingly at 8.30 or maybe 9 when they're finally free to go into a coma from which they have no guarantee of awakening. They'll tweet about it. I, I've lost count of how many tweets I've seen along those lines. Is 6.30 too early to go to bed? I really want to go to bed. I'm so tired. I've been on Twitter all day. So-and-so is so tired in the Twitter, in the, in the adapted Twitter handle of someone who has, in point of fact, never worked a full day in their life <laughs> and never done any ma manual labor whatsoever. But no, I'm so tired. I'm so tired of explaining the world to my intellectual betters. I mean, I'm 21. Do you have any idea the burden of all this omniscience is for me? There's nothing I don't know. Nothing at all. And there's so much that you don't know. It's such a burden to explain it to you. I, no wonder I'm tired. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. So tell me about the Spanish-American War. Uh, I think you have your dates wrong. America never went to war with Spain, okay? God, I'm so tired. Yeah, that's great. Good. Go off to bed, you. Uh, but I, I don't do that either. I don't, I don't do that, that enormous uh, operatic coma either. So out of 24 hours in a day, 10 hours, I spend reading maybe more than that. Some days more than that. I, I have a wonderful little dog. She's full of energy, but she also loves her downtime. She loves just lounge around, especially when it's warm. So she's not requiring my attention all the time like uh, she did when she was a puppy or like my two older dogs did when they were ailing, when they needed help a lot. Instead, she's perfectly happy to just hang out. So I do a lot of reading, an enormous amount out of 24 hours. Uh, let's see here. Question number five, do you read only physical books, ebooks, or audiobooks, or a combination of, uh, okay, the question says either three, but uh, all three, uh, I guess is what it means. And I, I, of course, choose a middle path because the question presumes that if you, if, you own, if you don't only read printed books, then you will read a combination of all three of these, and I don't. I've never been able to warm up to audiobooks. Never been able to do it. Uh, it I, everything that I've heard from people about the huge number of audiobooks they listen to gives me the impression that they mainly like audiobooks because they don't have to pay as much attention to them as they do a printed book. I mean, there's a lot of ele other elements involved. A lot of people like them because, you know, they're hands-free. You can play an audiobook in the car while you're driving or while you're at work at your, at your desk or whatever. But those things seem to me to be the equivalent of saying, I don't need to pay as much attention to this, right? I mean, you wouldn't read a printed book at your driving wheel in your car, steering wheel in your car. You wouldn't do that. So when you put an audiobook on, it seems to me that one of the luxuries people like about them is that you don't have to pay them quite so much attention. And I've never seen the appeal of that. And not only that, but also professionally, I can't, I have no interest in, in reading, in air quotes, a book that I'm not paying complete attention to, you know, I'm, I'm anyway. Uh, but uh, aside, if you leave audiobooks out of it, I read printed books and eBooks a lot and my mixture is far closer to being 50-50 now than it's ever been before. Most of you, some of you will, will know that I am, I am uh, a book critic. I got, in 2019 and 18 and 17 and 16, I got tons and tons of books in the mail every day from publishers. The publishers aren't at their offices now. Most of their mail docs are closed. That could change as time goes on, but right now I'm not getting those books. I am getting them instead in electronic format. The publicists are still getting in touch with me. I'm still seeing these things, but they're in electronic format. So my reading has moved a lot to, to eBooks and that I am perfectly okay with that. Quite a few of my reviewing colleagues, especially older ones, are not. They've never liked these things and they don't want to make the change and they don't like change period just as a, as a principle. And it's hard on them. You know, when a Simon & Schuster rep says, well, here's a new book, I know you're gonna like it. It's certainly in your wheelhouse. We'd love a New York Review of Books review here's the link to the PDF. I know quite a few reviewers who look at that last line and say, that has to be a joke, right? Send me the book. And <laughs> the pandemic doesn't care what kind of a, of a retro Luddite snob you are. <laughs> Pandemics don't care about that sort of thing. And if you are the kind of person who in mid-March or in early April said, go to your mailing office, put one of these copies in an envelope and send it to me, knowing that that person would be risking their own life, the lives of everyone they come in contact with during that day at home, the lives of everyone at the post office, the lives of everyone in the mailing truck, then, you know, <laughs> then you are extremely deficient as a person. <laughs> so, I don't know how many people have done that, but one way or another, a lot of my reading has shifted to eBooks. And I couldn't be happier about that. They are so easy to use in a critical venue. You can take as many notes as you want. You can look for anything in the text. They're very convenient, so uh, so I'd say it's approaching 50-50 between those two. Uh, then question number six is, what is your main pet peeve while trying to read? A lot of people, I imagine, would answer this with interruptions. Right? That one. But uh, I've been racking my brains to come up with a pet peeve. In terms of ebooks, it would be the remembering that your battery is running low. But I have developed a kind of routine now of just, without thinking about it, I've developed a kind of routine of having charging cables at 
major workplaces that stations where I go and at having devices constantly charged don't if you're leaving a room to go and do something else for hours on end make food take the dog for a walk whatever plug in all of your electronics so that you're not there plug them in so that they they are charging I've gotten into the habit of just doing that without thinking so the low battery mark on a on a electronic reading device isn't a pet peeve because it doesn't happen anymore uh, but I think most people the answer here would be being interrupted and that isn't one of mine for a couple of reasons number one I don't have any there's no there's no interruptions here I don't I've made it clear to everyone for decades now that I don't like talking on the phone and if you call me on the phone you're not gonna get me it's not like I'm gonna say hello <laughs> what do you want to talk about for a few hours of unplanned time no that's not gonna happen and also my surly house boy understands perfectly well that I read for a living that the the mortgage and whatnot the, the grocery bills the, the utility bills are all paid by my reading so I don't get interrupted is what I'm saying the only thing that would interrupt would be the needs of a dog and right now and for probably another 10 years my dog has minimal needs and that's fantastic but it's also uh, that interruptions wouldn't matter anyway I've lived in plenty of places where I had roommates I didn't know where I had uh, dormitory mates in college I've lived in plenty of places where interruptions were rife but they don't have any effect on me when I'm reading something I am lost to the world it's not possible to interrupt me unless you were to knock the book out of my hand it's it's not possible to do so I so for me I guess I don't really have many reading pet peeves anymore unless it's something that the author themselves is doing if the author is writing a book on quantum physics or the Habsburgs or whatever and I get to chapter three and I start to read stuff I've read before virtually word for word or in some cases actually word for word by from the same author from an earlier book ugh, <laughs> I'll keep reading it's a pet peeve but I'll, I'll keep reading but boy oh boy will I be getting more and more angry <laughs> uh, then let's see here question number seven is what is the strangest place you have found yourself reading I've read in a lot of strange places <laughs> a lot of them but uh, I'm gonna think of two there are two strange places that I have found myself reading I don't know how strange you well you'd probably consider both of them strange For those of you who are new to the channel I when I was younger I did a huge amount of traveling everywhere in the world except Australia and uh, one of the strange places that I found myself reading was uh, in the, the extreme Canadian north the extreme north of Canada where I was I was hiking in the woods with a bunch of dogs uh, and we could feel that a storm was coming that a snowstorm was coming a big one it, the day just got more and more metallic more and more foreboding and so and we were in the middle of nowhere and you don't want that to be true so I we started looking early in the morning we started looking for shelter and found a really nice little cave a little just a tiny little indentation very deep with a dip so that with proper covering over the front it would be a shelter against any kind of storm <laughs> and uh, it looked uh, we weren't gonna find anything better that's for sure so I sent in my most adventurous Beagle to make sure it wasn't already occupied he was it was a volunteer mission he knew perfectly well what he was doing he was a tough little boy and it was empty and we went in I had it I had a lantern and uh, a roll a, a mat and I had all those dogs and we had plenty of pine needles we set down a, a layer and there was a vent <laughs> and there was a, everything it was just perfect it was absolutely perfect and as the snow fell and slowly buried that little that little place where we all were I read and it was wonderful I had their company and we, we just waited it out <laughs> and the other place uh, the other strange place that I've read maybe even stranger than that was uh, again in the mountains this was this was hiking uh, I don't know what you'd call it hiking I was I was with a group of people I was hiking but it wasn't just myself I had my dogs and a bunch of of their dogs that just it was in Kashmir I was with a bunch of people who were uh, they they were working the land and they had a string of yaks I don't know if any of you ever met a yak. <laughs> They're an amazingly hardy bovine creature, long, shaggy fur, deceptively intelligent, uh, not all that uh, temperamental, actually kind of good company. And the people that I was with used the yaks for everything. They, they were absolutely essential to their industry, to their migrating, to their everything they did. 
they use their dogs as well, and uh, part of the reason that we got along so well is that they saw that their, their dogs were reacting differently to me than to anyone else, and I loved their babies, absolutely loved them. And again, we, there was an impending snowstorm, and uh, we were partially unsheltered, and the, you don't have to worry about that if you've got a string of yaks, because you can just l line them up together. And these, these were winter animals, that, so they had uh, shaggy fur that was hanging down almost to the ground. And what my host would do would be just to take shelter under the yak. And I did too. And red. <laughs> I, was, I was huddled around with my dogs. I was underneath the yak while it snowed and while I just read. <laughs> so so, so that, that was going to be my two, my two choices. In a, in a cave in the middle of nowhere in in the Canadian Rockies and in Kashmir underneath a yak. <laughs> so, so, uh, let's see here. And then question number eight. Are you a critical reader or do you just read for enjoyment? Uh, and I know that, that the originator of the tag probably means an either or. I want to make sure to stress with that just that there's nothing lesser about reading for enjoyment. I know we know this. I, the creator of the tag certainly knows this. Everybody else knows this. I just want to stress it. It's not critical reader or you're, are you only reading for pleasure. Those are just two different kinds of reading, and they can go together. I, of course, am a critical reader. Uh, pretty much of everything that I read. One way, I can't, it's a habit. Once you get into it, you can't get out of it. But I stress it doesn't lessen the enjoyment at all. At least, if you do it right, it doesn't lessen the enjoyment at all. It's ju it just means you're paying extra attention. Uh, sometimes... I will lapse out of that completely. I have a number of compulsive rereads where I'll just reread something for the 80 millionth time. And I probably am not reading that critically anymore. Although, every once in a while, I will, for instance, do a read along of such a thing on this channel. Something that I've read 100 million times. And when I read it again, I do notice new things. So it's not like critical reading shuts off. Um, but I would love to hear the answer from you. Do you read critically or not? Mostly. I'd love to hear that. But those were only the first eight questions. Now we're going to do the extra nosy route. <laughs> these are mine. And I'm going to add these on. I'll jot all these down below. Number nine is, is there some one specific thing that will immediately prompt you to stop reading a book? Uh, and it can be either something that the author does or something outside. Something in, in the, the non-reading experience. And uh, I can't think of anything that an author would do that would automatically make me stop reading, even regurgitating previous material, plagiarizing from their cells, I will still keep reading. Even explicitly lying, Tim Poole is not a leftist or even a centrist commentator. He is an arch-conservative, alt-conservative commentator, He's even an outright falsehood. Uh, the last Melania Trump book I had that I read was probably 80% falsehoods, 80% things that can be demonstrated that aren't true. I kept reading. I think the number one thing that would that would definitely prompt me to stop reading would be if somebody in my vicinity mentioned the words "all you can eat buffet." That would probably do it, and also dogs, of course. I could be deep, deep. You give me a, nine, a new nine hundred page biography of the Dutch humanist Erasmus, and you plop me down in a room, and I'm reading it, and I'm with a pencil in hand, and I'm having a blast, the time of my life. If a dog walked into that room, I would forget the book like it had never existed. It would just be gone. Not finger in the page, not bookmark in the page. I would just, I would just drop it completely to face smooch. Uh, but aside from that, all you can eat buffet or dogs. I'm not sure. I'm not sure there's anything else. Uh, question number ten is: Have you ever actually fallen asleep while reading? Now this is mainly me just sort of whistling past a graveyard because I know that a lot of you are going to say yes. I think this love affair that you have with going unconscious for ten hours out of every twenty-four is just revolting. <laughs> it's terrifying. You don't know you're going to wake up. To, I, one way or another, uh, I know that a lot of you read before bed. I'd be willing to bet that the combination of those two things means that you have, in fact, literally fallen asleep while reading a book. I can't imagine it myself. It's never happened to me. I can't imagine all the responses I would have even to a book that I find boring. Reading is so exciting to me that I, I just in general, that I, I don't, I can't, I'm, plus I'm not ever that sleepy so I, I don't my answer is definitely no but I'll be interested to hear yours uh, question number 11 is have you ever stolen a book you naughty thing you <laughs> and I have accidentally but it still counts I well, the Brattle bookshop here in Boston has outdoor sale carts uh, 
and I've gone to them for years and years, decades and decades. I've gone to those carts, and you, the carts are in in the good old days when before pandemic there would be lots of people out in in the lot on a good day, and so you can't say if you're looking at at a dollar cart and you see a book that you really like the look of, you can't say you shouldn't say, well I'm going to keep looking and I'll circle back to this because somebody will grab it, it'll be gone. So the habit that I fall into is. Ca- building an armload of books as I walk around the carts. And there was one day, there have been a couple of days actually over the decades, where I there's been some pickings at the cart and I've had just one book in hand. Or maybe I've had one book in hand and then I add another one and then I put it back, something like that. So that after a half an hour, 45 minutes, I've got one book in my hand and then I look at the clock and think, or my watch or now my phone, I, and think, oh my, I've got to get going. I just walk off. Because I'm, I'm always, I always have a book in my hand anyway. It's completely natural for me. So I just walk off with the book in my hand and, and realize to my horror that evening that I didn't actually pay for it. And then I would go back. I think one time that I did that, I was so sheepish about it that I just put the book back on the card. I didn't tell anybody about it. And the other time I, I told everyone about it so they could laugh at me. But that, that still counts. <laughs> but I want to hear your stories. You don't have to give any details if you're worried that the statute of limitations has, has not run out, but I want to hear details. Uh, then question number 12, what are your specific methods for dealing with book snobs? We've all had to deal with them uh, in one way or another. I've had to deal with them my whole life. And my method has changed. It used to be when I was younger that I went for the throat. I cannot stand condescension. I hate it. And I confess, I hate it most when it's directed at me. Maybe that has to do with the fact that I was socialized by a different species. Maybe there's a bit of an inferiority complex there, but one way or another, I hated it. And usually would go after the throat of someone who did it. Uh, because I have, I have found in the course of my life that a book snob is usually not as well read as I am. And that's their whole game. The minute you get them onto that territory, if, if, if that's true, they're defenseless. Nowadays, I, there's no point in doing that, I don't think. It doesn't teach anybody anything, and it doesn't feel all that good. So now, if I, if I realize that somebody I'm dealing with is a book snob, I just smile and politely change the subject away from books completely, if they'll let me. Sometimes they won't. Occasionally, in the last 15 years, somebody has said, no, 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 you're a critic. I've read your work. I said, come on, we got to talk about this. It's your job. And with them, I have a ready out. I can say, well, as you say, it's my job and I'm not at work right now, so I'd like to talk about something else. Uh, I, I don't ever confront book snobs anymore with the reason that I'm changing the subject, because I don't think they're, wor- they're, they're salvageable, so I, I just don't bother with it. But I want to hear yours. I want to hear your methods. Uh, and question number 13 is, look at your immediate surroundings and answer the simple question. Are you in control of your books, or are your books in control of you? And right now, I confess, my books are in control of me. There are books all over the place here all over the floor in miscellaneous piles. I have not taken the time. I need about an hour now in this room and a couple of other rooms. I need about an hour to gain control of my books, to regain control of my books. And I just haven't done it. That's all. I suspect that some of you are not an hour behind, but days or even weeks, maybe years behind. And I want to hear all about it. Who's got the upper hand? (laughs) Uh, Then question number 14, have you ever watched a movie or TV show and wished it were a book? Uh, and my answer is yes, of course it is, yes, but my, my, the specific things that came to mind are going to seem a little confusing at first because you'd think, well, not only was, were those a book, but those were a million books. But I'm talking about something that really does a great job, that is a great book. And that is the Star Trek incarnations, the various Star Trek incarnations. Star Trek Enterprise, Star Trek Voyager, and Star Trek Deep Space Nine. I would like a great novel or a couple of great novels set telling the story that we see in those arcs. In, uh, well, Voyager and Deep Space Nine are arcs, because Deep Space Nine starts with Benjamin Sisko taking control of the station, Deep Space Nine. Then you get all the whole arc of his life until his apparent death at the end. Same thing with Star Trek Voyager. At the very beginning, Voyager is thrown across the galaxy and needs to get back home. And the whole of the story is that arc with all sorts of high points and low points in between. I would love it if somebody would write that novel, the novel of those stories. (laughs) Uh, uh, 
putting them in their place, putting them in their perspective, maybe not giving any attention to some of them, lots of attention to others, so that you craft one whole narrative out of those storylines now that they're over. And Star Trek Enterprise was cancelled, of course, so it, it doesn't have a complete arc, but one is fainted at. It starts with Jonathan Archer taking command of the Enterprise, the very first spacefaring Enterprise, the very first warp-capable Enterprise. And we gather from the, the hastily mocked together final episode that Jonathan Arthur go, Archer goes on to become a legendary figure. So he goes from being a, a chip on his shoulder hothead at the very beginning of, of the Federation and Starfleet to being this foundational character. That is a kind of arc. I would love to see somebody write that. I just, these books don't exist. There are tons and tons of novels set in all of those storylines. But not that one thing, the one thing that I'm thinking of. Uh, that just hasn't happened. Actually, you know, technically it hasn't happened for uh, for Star Trek the original series or Star Trek The Next Generation either. I would kind of like that. Uh, then uh, question number 14, have you ever written to an author? I have many times. You can interpret the question as have you ever written to an author you don't know? Out of the blue. And I'd love to hear those stories. Uh, and uh, question number 16 is what is your sorting ritual for new books? They go. They stay in the bag for a while. Do they go onto a table? Do they go closer and closer to your armchair? Do they eventually go to a bookshelf? Do they go to a bookshelf right away? Uh, my own ritual is that they go to the uh, a stack either next to the bed, if it's freezing cold, or next to the couch if it's not, where I can examine them at my leisure, and then the goal is to go at that stack and reshelve it put those things where they belong. And the reason why my books are temporarily in control of me is because I haven't done that in the last few times. I need to do that. But I want to hear yours. I want to hear your rituals. And I'm going to leave a list of people that I'm tagging down below. I have a list here of people that I'm tagging. But I want everybody to do this because I am a nosy booktuber. <laughs> so if you have a booktube channel and you see this video, I want you to make an answer to these questions. I want to know them all. But anyway, this tag has gone long as my tags tend to do. So I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, book two.